Welcome to the Silicon Slopes podcast. We're here with Matt Brown, who's the CEO of Living Scriptures. How are you? Great. Wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. It is Monday, and you drove down from Ogden, so mm-hmm. thank you. Yep, thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Um, I think a lot of people, um, regardless of their age, when you say Living Scriptures, there's some history there. There so. is absolutely a lot of history. We've got, uh, what, 47 years of history, so we're coming up on the Big 50, huh? Yeah. And so I'm generation two. Very cool. Give us a little bit of a, of a history lesson of living scriptures and then kind of start diving into it. All right. Well, we could be here all day on that part, <laughs> but I'm going to give the brief overview. Um, living scriptures started from my father who learned he was an excellent salesperson at another company called Promised Land Publications. And when uh, he wanted to see if the company could go a different direction, that all kind of fell, fell out. And um, oddly enough, the opposing attorney who was helping him through this uh, ordeal, uh, he was his name's Orrin Hatch. You may have heard of him. Yep. And uh, so he actually owned these rights, these Seventh Day Adventist tapes. And he came to m- approach my dad and said, "Hey, you know what? I, maybe you want to sell these for me. And now that you now you don't have anything to sell because you're not working for them." And so, um, so he decided to organize the business and license those rights because, and because pretty quickly, Orrin Hatch was elected as a senator, and at that point, there was really no reason to have a business, you know, partnership from there on. And so, uh, that's what they sold, and they sold those for several years, and then they started producing their own, and then the big leap into animation, which that's what we're still very well known for, um, and many, many years of animating. And, millions and millions of dollars, a side company that went over to Dallas. Um, I worked for them for a few years, um, marketing it to the Christian market. So there's just a lot of history. The version one is, uh, is the audio version two is the video version three is the streaming. And we can talk about version four as we go, but, um, we've just had a beautiful history ups and downs. And probably one of the biggest things, um, is just that transformation of 44 years. I had to kind of say goodbye to the business model and, and start it up again. Yeah. And this is, these are stories from uh, the Old Testament, New Testament, mm-hmm. and then for on the LDS side, like mm-hmm. Book of Mormon and mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Church and history stuff. Yeah. Church history. And uh, depending on how old you are, because that's you know, right. five or six different generations, <laughs> that that is associate several. it with maybe a kiosk. Yeah, in the, yeah. In the mall, right? Yep, that was the business model. I mean, we they, they really focused on, um, and in fact, this is kind of an interesting side note, is that there were very few really people that understood the power of a return missionary, because you've got somebody who's got two years of experience of really sales type experience, right? You're knocking doors and you're and you're having to, to go through that grid. And so when people came, came back from missions, um, there was so much skill in that. And yet they didn't really, you know, they'd go back and work at, you know, the dairy, whatever, you know, whatever kind of interesting things they were doing. And, and so that was one of the early things that Living Scriptures was building on. And so we had so many companies before, you know, the pest control, the alarm companies um, that, that, you know, we were really doing well with getting salespeople. Now, eventually that became a major impediment for us because we could no longer recruit those, those good return missionaries because they were so well sought after. Yeah. And compensated really and well. And compensated, yeah. And and actually, I mean, that's another part of the history is that, you know, with that becoming a bigger and bigger pressure and then Netflix becoming a bigger pressure on the, the driving the price of media down, um, pretty soon that became just unsustainable. Yeah. But at, at your guys' core, you're you're telling stories and, and doing videos and illustrations. Yeah. And then you mentioned uh, kind of three kind of generations or waves. Yeah, yeah. World well, changes, right? Yeah, and and the truth is, is the business, you know, the core mission of the business has never changed, you know, and, and it's really, there's a deep desire to help families and anybody, you know, develop a spiritual foundation because, you know, especially some people like with the audio, they, they would love those audio because they just didn't know the scriptures and it brought it to life, right? And you can, you can interact with these stories a bit and, and feel like you're there. You know, and then um, as time went on, then it went into the, the, you know, the next version and the animations and then kids who can't read. Right. And so they're like, ah, oh, wow, you know, now I can really feel these stories. So that's always been the core is laying that foundation. But we've we've expanded further and further out to, you know, basically just have great media for your family. And it doesn't have to, you know, most of our stuff actually isn't even religious anymore. Yeah, <laughs> there's still that core, but there there is stuff that isn't. Gotcha. And then. 
so you mentioned like a cool starting point and uh mm-hmm. you know you'll be at the 50 year uh birthday soon enough. yeah um you you've kind of been a part of it in some way or another since the beginning but um as uh kind of the leader since like the mid to early 2000s um and yeah. so as the world's changed and new inventions occur and I assume you're watching them closer than others, you know, like, well, it looks like there's no more blockbusters. What's this next <laughs> Netflix thing? Right. It seems like we're in a little bit of the same business here. Um, you mentioned, you know, it's about four years ago. Is that accurate? Where it's, like, I think it's been almost, well, it's actually been 10 when, you know, the, when we could see the, the, the slow moving freight train, Yeah. you know what I mean? And we could see that there was, you know, absolutely that streaming was going to be the future, right? That just DVD was not going to be it. And so, and there was a lot of debate actually for a while whether or not we'd be doing digital downloads because a lot of people were asking for digital downloads. And I could see pretty clearly, like, you know, it's kind of a little bit of Steve Jobs stuff. It's like, it's messy. You know, you got to load that on there and onto your iPod or whatever, you know, and then load it off and, and to have to manage all that. And I could just go, you know, streaming is the way that we have to go. There's no doubt in my mind. And so, you know, at that point also, we had to start choosing how to do that. And boy, that's, you know, when you're a business leader, you're like, okay, off the shelf, you know, or can we build it or buy it or whatnot? And so there just wasn't anything good enough at the time. And there's a few things maybe now that are okay, but if you don't really build that well, you know, you're not going to have a great end end user experience. And so we started building that. And honestly, for the first few years, it was a bad experience. And so what we'd end up doing is coupling that with the actual DVD. So they'd go out there and say, okay, you got to buy the DVD and you also get the streaming too. So you can log into the streaming system. But I was definitely not proud of that system for a few years, and there was a lot of bugs and glitches. But, um, you know, as time went on, we, you know, just kept building, just kept building. And, and I definitely believe that a certain amount of our business always has to be in the tech side and always has to continue to say, what can we do to innovate and make this bigger and better, right? Yeah. So ultimately, the buck stops with you on, on those types of decisions. You're mm-hmm. obviously listening to the team and watching the, the macro environment. Um, <clears throat> But the decision ultimately needs to be made, mm-hmm. and it could be like a knee-jerk decision, which sometimes occurs. Like you wake up one day and like, all right, we're putting it in reverse. Yeah, yeah. And uh, or it might be like a long series of well, decisions. And How did it work? Well, for what's you? what's funny is it's a lot like. I mean, there were several things. Like some things you just didn't know for sure. Like you know, for forty-four years we held on to a, sell, a direct sales force. And so that was just this enormous leap of faith, which I don't know if I'd call it a leap of faith, but it was tell it, you know, there was no choice left, you know. And I remember uh, when I, and, and, you know, there's a lot of tragedy in the story, right? And that is that um, our backs against the wall, the sales are declining, the other companies are just eating our lunch, Netflix eating our lunch. And, you know, again, we're seeing, you know, when that, it's nice to see that, that thing going up, the graph going up, but the graph is going down now and every year it's going down. And so, you know, there's got to be some major changes. And so um, basically, I kind of liken it to one of our videos, actually. And, and, you know, people know, you know, the Columbus story. And, and you are out there and you, you realize you have to be over at the new world, you know. But you don't know if you're going to make, you don't even know if you've got, you know, enough wind to get there. You don't know all the things. And yet, um, you know, another one analogy is like the, you know, burning the ships. The ship, the current ship is just not going to work anymore. And so it's kind of like you're going to have to start building a new ship while you're still sailing your old ship. And just, and it's got to be a faster ship and it's got to be more nimble. And so in a lot of sense, you know, I, I guess not a lot of people and companies ha- get to go through that, you know, successfully. Right. We hear of that, you know, creative disruption and all that. And so many companies just know they have to they want to cling to the very last day. Yeah. And, and yet. Um, you know, there comes a time where, you know, you have to get, you know, go sail to the other side. And so that was very harrowing, you know, and the, some of the hard things too, is that, um, there's a sales manager on the other side that's, you know, he's got his ideas. And so at that time I was actually not the CEO. I was the, um, co, you know, co uh, vice presidents and my dad was the CEO and he kind of wasn't <laughs> involved as much anymore. Yeah. He just didn't really know what to do. And so there's kind of like this duking out between me and the other vice president. And finally, it came to the end where my dad had, you know, literally the other guys like it's either him or me, you know, times. And it's like, uh, well, that's kind of tough. To, <laughs> that's tough. To, but, you know, he, he, my dad's he, he's definitely not nepotistic at all. It's kind of like, well, listen, I can see 
the, he represents the future. He has a tech side to him. He has an operation side to him. And I can see that the future's got to be in streaming. And, and so, you know, some, he's, he's more of a part of this than you're probably going to be. Yeah. And eventually he stepped aside and just said, I'm done. And so that's where I got promoted by, um, whatever you call that, promoted by death. Yeah. <laughs> Which is terrible, right? That's like one of the worst ways to get, because because now we're dealing with imposter syndrome, you yeah. know, and so it's like, well, and I, you know, again, you'd think that, you know, being the son of the, the, the president and all that, that I would be the person to um, just, you know, oh, great, I'm stepping right in. But I didn't know, you know, there's a lot of our lives that we don't know what the future holds. We don't even know what we're capable of, and we don't know. We just sometimes keep sailing through. And so um, I eventually, um, you know, just, kept doing it. You know, that's the fake it till you make it. I just kind of had to say, well, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. And I don't know. And it was, that was, you know, probably the hardest time of my life really yeah. to say, okay, I got to do this. This, this has to be done, you know, cause I believe so much in the company and that's sometimes that can be dangerous. Right. Yeah. But I believe so much in what we were doing and what we could continue to do. And so then I, I you know, I stepped into the role and you know, there are several mistakes made, right? You don't know what you're doing. You're filling it out. And, but finally, um, as we kind of realized, I actually had, you know, a great gift who didn't turn out to be, you know, there was some definitely honesty issues and he's no longer with us, but he was just running the marketing so hard on another, on the telemarketing side of the business that that sustained us, that gave us the fuel we needed a bit to get to the, to the promised land, as we'll call it, um, to, to continue on. And so again, I, I was waiting for him to say when people no longer wanted DVDs. Yeah. And when that kind of, that was a big switch, you know, that I was realizing, okay, as soon as that hits, we're going all in, all, all, you know, all content, all access, you know, no more selling sets and selling individual stuff. It's just full on, here it is all going. And, and, you know, again, even then we were trying to sell it for 30 bucks a month. Right. And good luck with that. Yeah. So finally, um, you know, we realized, and then, you know, the, the data was pretty clear. It's like, if you go $1 above $10 a month, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the sales drop in half. And so, so at that point we just went, okay, it's 10 bucks a month. And, you know, we're going to sell this and get more digital. And, 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 and then that's kind of where the early days of also Facebook and stuff. And, and again, that was also major, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't have survived without Facebook hmm. and there's no way because there was no way to target LDS people except for the way we were doing it or through the church, which that wasn't an option or through Deseret book, you know? And so there was really only one option for us to continue to gain new names. Um, not that, you know, not knocking doors. So finally, um, you know, we had that and, and basically we you know, grew that business and, and again, you know, service businesses are a whole new beast. So that was, that was the second big change, right? A revolution is that you go, well, I guess, you know, we were in a product and now this is a service. And so wait, you know, for, for a lot of it, you know, some of the salespeople were not the most honest and great and wouldn't say the right things that they should have been saying. And so sometimes, you know, they, there's like, as long as they could make a sale, that's how sometimes they felt. And so now, you know, we realize that we have to love our customers. We have to do everything we can to provide them with great, great service. And, you know, any service business knows this. It's like, the level of, of performance has just got to be tremendous to, to keep people happy and engaged, right? Yeah. How was that for an answer? That was great. <laughs> um, gets more an or questions, right? So um, you're changing technology platforms and business models, and um, you have a lot more customers that need good customer service, mm -hmm. right? And a lot more customers because you know, for a long time, you know, it was about 12,000 is what we were kind of usually with. And, and we're now at, um, what is it? 60, about 65,000. I'm not shy about sharing that. And again, you know, in a small LDS type market, I'm sure we could get up to 200 if we were really, everything was perfect, you know, but, um, but it's a pretty limited market, even though 65,000, you know, to get one customer sometimes is hard and to get 65,000, I'm pretty dang proud of that number. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And the data showing like what's landing well, what's not landing well, and you're uh, I mean, able just, to pivot quicker. Just like Netflix, you know, you got a lot of data and, you know, we, we don't have the same, you know, level of, of expertise in knowing the data. Um, but we do know what's being watched and we know what people like the best and what kind of content um, is the most important to people. And so at one point um, I realized, you know, every week we try to have something for people and we had our old Book of Mormon and New Testament and Old Testament stories. And so if the church was studying one of those 
curriculums, you know, then with a come follow me, we'd, oh, okay, here's this, you know, and here's this video. But we realized that that wasn't enough. And we really needed to have a lot more content every single week. And so I started looking around. There's another group out there that I just have such admiration for. It's called The Bible Project. And they do these really, really well done explainer videos on the Bible. And, um, but they're not for kids, you know, they're more for adults. And so I looked at those and I, and I started just to say, I, you know, this is what we got to do. And in some sense, it's to me, to me, it's sad sometimes when you feel like maybe there's a step backwards, um, because the animation quality is nowhere near as good as where we were. I mean, we were running Disney animation quality, um, a former Disney producer with our animations. And so to go from there, you know, but, but at the same time, I've got to produce something every single week, right? And these were produced once every three months, and they were ex- very, very expensive. And so with streaming, that's another major problem is, is if you don't have massive amounts of people, the content, you know, the amount you, you, you know, you're paying per person for the content is so much less than like when you go buy a DVD, that, that price is you know, a thousand times more, right, for per watch. Yeah. And so now it's like, okay, you know, you get so little money for that. And so anyway, but I build a new model around that. And, um, and that content, and I share it on YouTube for free. So it's called um, uh, Line Upon Line. And just phenomenally great. So I've gotten, you know, I, I, I wrote the first year and recorded it. And, and again, it, it helped me understand what I believed is needed these, these needed to be. I, you know, added the humor. So there's a lot of elements of me that I kind of said, this is how, you know, and, and I understand the company, right? The DNA of the company. And it, there's yeah. humor, there's entertainment, and there's insight. And it's really a combination of those three. And so anyway, we, we made the first season. Then the second season, we actually even got the, um, what's it called? The Utah Film Commission. So, so we began kind of, you know, inching into these bigger arenas and so they 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 fun, help fund some of that on the second season and anyway it's just you know we've got over 60 whatever thousand views you know per video about now and that's that's going very well as well and so again that's kind of one of those things to is a business you have to have that engagement and every single week um, people are there watching those come follow me videos and as well as uh, we've done a new segment so those, those two you know, I feel like I'm two for two on content right now. And, and again, we're, we're looking towards the future of what, what's next, right? Yeah. So that's kind of the creative side, right? You've yeah. Got the spreadsheets and the data and all that <laughs> as a CEO. But then it's, you get to have a little bit of fun with the content creation. It sounds like that might be where you're going to focus on the future. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, totally. And, 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 you know, you were mentioning some of the things when I was young, you know, I used to feel bad a little bit about myself because I'd see this kid's really great at basketball and this kid's really great at math or whatever. And I just was like, I'm really good at a lot of things, but I'm not great at anything. Right. And that was a big frustration. And, you know, these are kind of the things how some of those things that are, you know, maybe we feel at our, our weaknesses can very much become our strengths. And so, um, you know, I've, as a CEO, you know, to be good at everything, you know, or a lot of things, but not great at anything, you know, that's a, that's a very important skill. And so again, like the tech side you're mentioning and the operation sides and the artistic side and the content side, I've got to keep, you know, and it's through three balls that I'm constantly having to juggle. Yeah. Um, but we've hit a point where I believe, um, right now the content side is, and again, when I first started the streaming, everyone's like, oh, you got to make content. That's the only way to do this. And I knew, I'm like, why should I make content when I can license so much easier and really great stuff that so many of our viewers have never even heard of, but it's still amazing. So to them, it's brand new content. Yeah. And now we've hit a point where we've got it all pretty much. You know, There's very little that we don't have. And so therefore... Um, it, but also I realized that our audience, you know, with, with the film industry and with the, the virus and everything, there's just not a lot of new content being created. And so I've, I've kind of started to say, okay, how much, and I still haven't worked this all out, but it's like, there's accounting stuff. Cause you go, Oh, what do you do with depreciation of the movies and all this that you got to put all into a spreadsheet to say, how are we going to make new movies? Right. And you know, there's kind of two choices, right? There's, there's the series and there's the movies and and I feel like still right now movies is the way to go but I'm just so a little bit concerned you know say in a year or six months I finish a movie and I want to release it in the theaters and oh my goodness we're pulling every you know shutting back down again so again there's some uncertainty there 
but I believe that that can help propel you. Um, I like kind of the HBO Max model a little bit, how they've kind of done 30 days um, of a, the, the latest big movie, and that's trying to get people to subscribe, really, is what they're trying to do, and, and then also keep the people who are there happy. And if you don't watch in those 30 days, good luck, right? If you haven't noticed, if you've ever noticed that it's, yeah. it's gone, you're going to have to buy it for $25. So, yeah. so I like that model. That's kind of the model I'd like to follow a little bit more. Um, but we're still in the very early stages of that model to start um, having, you know, really great high quality film content to come in. Uh, because again, you know, with the subscriber base, it, it doesn't pay anywhere near you'd want it to, right? Yeah. So again, 100 million customers, you can pretty well just throw money in the win. <laughs> I have to be very strategic with what we're doing right now. Yeah. And let's talk about that a little bit because, um, you know, Venture Capital 101, if you're going to get pitched, um, there's certain... Uh, key factors, right? There's the team and the financials, but oftentimes market size, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's the market size for uh, diapers and that's always a good <laughs> exercise. How many? Right, right. Uh, it's a good exercise in any business, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's um, a certain amount of LDS folks on planet Earth. Yep. And so I assume your guys' market size is, all right, we can capture them all, you know, we've got 10%. Yeah, I'd say um, there might be guys, a go about that well you know I, I had a guy who worked for venture capital and um, a Swedish guy Bo Gustafsson I think if I'm not Great hacking name. up his last name but you know when I knew I was out of my element and I was in the deeper waters that probably I was like you know there's got to be some smarter people out there than me on this because I've got to rebuild a business and so I started working with him and he did it he helped me develop a little bit of a um, total addressable market, as they call it, the TAM. Yep. And um, and so, you know, we ran some numbers and stuff. And so that 100,000 number is kind of still the, the elusive number. COVID, by the way, you know, what a blessing for us. I mean, you know, it's terrible when the whole world is, you know, having issues and businesses are failing. And yet here I go, you know, that so much is being pushed my way. Right. And that was, you know, we were just totally, you know, fortunate in that sense to have that pushed our way. And so our business really doubled pretty quickly right then. And, you know, could I have gone back? I'm maxing out every credit card, you know, going, oh my gosh, because it has to all be credit card. And how many credit cards can I find to get, you know, <laughs> to get in here and, and, and to spend as much money as we could during those few months, the first few months of COVID. Um, but, uh, you know, to continue to grow, it's very hard, you know, because you, you've, you're, you, we really are comp competing against Netflix. We're competing against Disney. And, you know, it's like, it's hard for me to not, you know, to have a little bit of umbrage there, right? It's like, you know, when you're the leader, you're like, in your own family, you know, like, what are you guys going to watch? You know, it's like, oh, we want Disney, you know, and you're like, oh, you know, because we have so much other stuff, right? We have, oh, yeah. we have strawberry shortcake and we have, you know, all kinds of family stuff. And so I guess that's something kind of also address is that um, we've meant it to be just this platform for every age group. And so we've got teenagers movies and we've got adult movies. And, and so there's kind of three main markets we also focus on the, the scholars and so there's a lot of really scholarly type of BYU, you know, scholarly smart content um, uh, documentaries. We've created many documentaries. And then we have the feel good market. And so there's a lot of people that just want to watch that uplifting, wonderful show. And then there's the children market. And so those are all three that, um, but we, you know, people still very well, brand awareness is still very much on that children part of the market. And, and, and again, we find that actually a lot of stuff that's watched is in that feel good market, but on that other market, we, you know, haven't cracked quite yet. But again, I know that there's still a lot of work to be done. And, and in order to grow, you kind of have to get eyeballs, you know, have to get people excited and, and interested. And so that's why the, the films, you know, having brand new movies that are top notch movies, I think that that will help us. Yeah. And are these movies like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 90 minutes? What are your... These would be full-on theatricals. Full on. You know what I mean? So, you know, whatever. T.C. Christensen's a great friend and partner of ours. He doesn't necessarily um, need us to fund him because he's very well funded. But um, at the same time, um, you know, partnering with people like that to be able to make the, the best that the LDS media has to offer. And, you know, he's, I just respect him so much. He's made, I think he's one of the best movie producers we've had. Um, and the types of films and the, the level of quality and all that has, has, I think, kind of raised the bar for a lot of people. And, you know, it's interesting because the LDS film industry alone is just a funny, you know, kind of industry. And, and the, the twists and turns that's taken with, um, 
you know, there was a time where comedy was really big. And then that, that there was a big backlash, if you're not aware. I mean, some of the stuff is fun for your listeners. But, you know, people were like, ah, I'm so tired of movies that make fun of our own culture, you know. And it was like, okay, well, <laughs> sure. But, um, but you know, it's, it's coming up with those type of films that people, you know, we, we kind of feel like the um, there's a little bit of a genre here that I believe in. And that is the true story that's very powerful, um, that also can be exportable. Um, powerful meaning insp- inspirational that can also be exportable. I'm I'm not interested in making movies just for you know Mormons to laugh at more, you know LDS to laugh at and and think oh this is just for us. I'm very much actually very much interested in making films that can show the human experience um, and how that has happened in our own culture um, in the in the LDS you know the Latter Day Saint market and 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 so it's kind of like to show people like look what's happened here and and and. Th- th- these people are just like us sometimes, you know, that they're not that different. And yet they went through some very different experiences. Um, but yet it's still the same human condition and the struggle and the, the love. And, and, and again, at the end of the day, the, the guiding principles um, that, I, you know, God gave us t- to be wonderful human individuals. And I think we're all inspired that by that. You know, there's a lot of times where God's never mentioned in a movie, but yet we feel that powerful emotion that, you know, we're all being guided and we're all wanting to go to um, become better people and, and become, you know, just a, a more happy, delightsome people. Yeah. Yeah. So if I, you know, if I won a $5 billion lottery and I had to do a <laughs> billion dollars for a movie studio, um, you know, I read a lot of good books and listen to a lot of good books, and I'm like, dang it, I wish this was made into, like, a really good movie. Not yeah, some yeah. Not jankity yeah, yeah. movie, a really good one. Um, how do you, and so that, again, mythical studio yeah, yeah. that I've got. But you've got one, and you've got <clears throat> all this years of experience. How do you guys decide on what stories to tell next? You know, again, it's, it's like I was saying, um, there's the... You know, obviously somebody has to be able to recognize this is just a good story, Yeah. you know, and I love um, some of those principles of a good story. Uh, I didn't really, you know, it's kind of funny because it's just that same problem. You know, if you if you didn't go to film school, then what do you do? You know, when you all of a sudden you're, you need to become a movie producer. Right. And so um, yet I, there's a lot of love of that, you know, and I, I love, um, you know, there's the three act play. There's the. Um, the fallen guard, you know, I was teaching a primary class recently and it was way over their heads. It was kind of sadly hilarious, but, um, how much, uh, all movies are like the same, right? If you, you know, and you've got, and this comes from my high school learning as far as Joseph Campbell and the many faces of the hero. It's a very famous book that kind of goes, talks about the hero's journey. And, and it's really, to me, it's all based on the Adam and Eve story. You know, and you and, and they actually call it the fallen garden. Well, the fall from the garden, right? Yeah. And so fallen garden is you start out and, you know, you have to get a setting. And so, again, following some of these templates, right, and, and building the characters. And so I think I've got a little bit of that inherently with me. But, again, I've got to build a team of people around me that can also very much see, oh, this is amazing. This is a great story. You know, in, in, in the content business, everything begins with a great story. And if you can't. You know, in other words, if if someone doesn't read it and go, oh, my gosh, I I feel so moved by this story, you know, good luck. Right. That you got to have those underpinnings. But, you know, the more you go um, into the the, the fleshing it out and and building the characters and building the um, scenes and the sets and all of that, you know, obviously that's an important part of it. But I mean, one of the some of the great movies are are so low budget. Right. And it's just a matter of, of somebody who could really work a story and and work. Um, you, you are, you're emotional into that. And so again, all that has to be there. And at the end of the day, you know, you want to show that, um, in in my, what I want to show is that we are led by a higher power, that there's somebody that cares about us that, you know, through that, um, we can overcome. And I think that's just a beautiful part of humanity. And I, I believe it's the human story, right? Everybody, you know, we're all kind of fallen funny people that don't understand what we're doing at times. And, and yet, um, at the end of the day, we've got to move forward and we've got to persevere and, and, you know, and we've got to be the story, right? At the end of the day, at the end of our lives, you know, hopefully there is a story to tell that we can say, look, we, we, we did our best and there was some good result of that. And, and again, from, you know, uh, I probably hate using the word pride, but you know, we, we are just grateful that, you know, my father and I and the people that have been part of this business, cause it's definitely not just us. We're so grateful for so many people to have, um, allowed us to, um, create content, create, um, stories 
right, that, that move people to want to be better people. And I believe um, that is one of those, you know, the fuels of life that we need. And again, that's what perhaps why we're here today, you know, is listeners want to, to hear a story that kind of moves them to want them to be better and, and to be better business leaders, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I don't consider my, I, you know, I did business school and I went to BYU and, and, and top accounting pro. I, I had a good trajectory, but I don't consider myself some, you know, amazing business leader. I consider myself, you know, the, the kind of guy that just says, what needs to, you know, what do we need to do? And let's figure out how to do it. Um, you know, I have developed an interest in, in what do you call it? Strategy, right? Yeah. And that, that's you know, almost a natural part of what you have to be to kind of lead a team but yeah anyway I, i've i've had a fun run <laughs> yeah for sure well the stakes are high for you guys right because like um my wife recently is like let's watch this movie and it's usually a no for me yeah like, no and uh you know there's like uh thousands and thousands of shows that millions of people worked on yeah and i won't even watch it if it's free right? yeah yeah um but uh i couldn't i made it through for a couple of minutes then just got up and went about uh, and then came back and the credits were rolling and I was more enthralled with the credits <laughs> of like thousands of people worked on yeah, this Yeah, yeah. I got up five minutes into it, um, had no interest in it, you know, but these are big studios, right? And they can have a couple of duds, but for you guys, you got to be a little bit more targeted, right? So I yeah. assume it's kind of a jittery experience picking. I'll, I'll go into this a little bit. And again, this is a, perhaps out of my playbook. Um, and that is that I believe that um, I've been through harrowing times. Yeah. And I've seen that um, it's always better to have contingencies and really what I'd call pillars um, to be able to stand on. And so if one pillar, you know, diversification, if one pillar is is faulty, um, you have other pillars. Right. And so that's where when I'm creating films, I don't want to just have. You know, I don't want to go, OK, you know, it's Friday, whatever Friday. I sure hope when we release this film, people are going to go see it. You know, that to me is too dang scary. Right. And so um, some of these pillars are um, and this is really a fascinating one. I'll get into this in a second. But um, we've got, uh, you know, graciously the Film Commission, you know, and I love that. And I'm fighting for the Film Commission. You know, I believe that film in Utah is a very important part of our our state. And I believe that um that there's so much good that can be done to help even export the state's values and what we believe in as a state um, to the rest of the world to show this is, you know, I, I believe Utah leads the way in a lot of places. And I think um, hopefully we're s- slightly humble about that. But at the same time, um, I think bringing film here in Utah is a very important part. And so, again, the Film Commission has been so wonderful to us. And I believe there's a great relationship there in the future. And so, again, um, that's a pillar, um, having some of the funds from the Film Commission. Mm -hmm. And then another pillar is um, there's still a few DVDs sold out there. And so I believe that we could sell some DVDs. I believe another major pillar is that exportable word. And again, it's it's not telling stories for our own people. It's telling stories that everybody can resonate with. And so if I tell that story rather than, you know, something that's inside jokes that only, you know, maybe members of the church would understand, that's not my business, right? And so that's a pillar to make that exportable so that the audience outside of Utah, um, outside of LDSness, um, can can really resonate and love that. Um, and then the final one, um, there are a couple others, you know, some of them are just ideas like a Kickstarter kind of thing and all that, but, yeah. um, and, and the regular theatrical sales, but the final one is really kind of an interesting hobby right now. And that is, I've kind of seen that, Hey, you know what, there's a potential here and we've started already, you know, releasing this business is it, I call it living cinema. So I'm starting to use that living word and branding other things with living, living cinema. And basically we're, we're trying to get films that have maybe never been heard of much in the theater or right now they're just a little bit older, but eventually I want to build a club of people who go to the cinema, just like I've got a club of people, you know, streaming group of people who stream and every single month they go to the theaters and they know that living scriptures or living cinema has cultured and they're, they've already chosen like the best film that I could possibly watch. That's going to be inspirational that my whole family can enjoy. And, and basically we're into the curation business a lot. Mm-hmm. And so I bring this film and again, there's some of them like American underdog. If you've heard of them, uh, that film probably haven't, I don't know. Right. See, and this is part of the problem is, is the Christian market does have some really great films being made, but, but it's so hard to get that voice out. 
And so with my little voice of, of uh, my company, Living Scriptures, I can curate this group of people and then hopefully they can tell their friends and stuff. But um, basically I can get that movie for fairly inexpensive after it's left the theater for 30 days and I can bring it back for my movie club. And they're ba basically there for, um, I do believe there's a great idea in there, but right now, you know, selling that right now, we, we, we had to kind of shut out, shut down selling it because everyone's like, oh my gosh, I can go to the theater. I might die. Right. Sure. And so, yeah. but that movie club idea is just, I think super fascinating and building that into like a subscription where just every month, you know, and, and actually I'm trying to make it a little bit more budget friendly than a normal movie, but you can bring your whole family and bring, bring your friends. So you have a date night. And, and so anyway, that movie club thing is, I believe there's a lot of wheels in that. So, so that's my, there's, you know, five pillars in that. And so again, um, I've, I see. Yeah, it's absolutely insane to go in the movie business sometimes, right? To yeah. go, oh my! Especially the the you know independent movie business. Those those big studios gobble up so much of that air, and even the the streaming services gobble up so much of everything that um, you know there there's still a place for the niches to be able to operate, and that's where we we live and we love it. Yeah, and that's exciting to have new ideas. And I actually I, that's a really cool idea. A little bit of Back to the Future. You're tying in modern metrics and streaming and all of those you know data abilities but you're going back to movie theater yeah yeah again if i had a magic wand and uh had a billion dollars i'd love to have a movie theater that showed uh like back to the future <laughs> and whatever the price was to go to the movie in 1985 oh right came out, that's what the <laughs> yeah. price would be you know? yeah and it's just you'd kind of transform it back to uh, nostalgic, which, you know, movie theaters for a lot of people are actually already nostalgic. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, maybe they are. I still believe in the theater experience. Yeah. I mean, if you've, you know, if you've been to the theater, it's, it, the price is kind of a, a hard pill to swallow maybe for some people, but um, it's just, it, it really comes back to um, the world we live in with so much distraction like, you know, if you try to watch a movie and then you get up, get your popcorn and I'll, I'll, there's a, a ding on my phone. And, and, and so I do actually believe that, um, you know, we're wonderful directors. They're, they're doing so much to, to build and, and to captivate your heart and your mind. And you ruin that. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you ruin that as soon as you start having some distractions around. And even, you know, um, sometimes, you know, you'll start a movie and, and then you'll, oh, can't finish it tonight. And, and you've ruined, to me, you've ruined the movie. Like somebody put all their heart and soul to make that, build that emotion and build all that yeah. to a culminating point. And, and at the end, you know, if we turn it off, you know, so I'm maybe a little bit of a stickler that way. And so, but what, what I'm really saying is that um, I believe in powerful, um, spiritual experiences that we can have that, you know, build our souls and our minds. And that's where I believe that these type of films can do that. And, and, and again, see, I have to go through the same debate and I haven't re come to a resolution and that's, we live in addict an addiction society. Everything is addiction, right? So many of these services and things that are out there are completely like, how do we wire the brain to do addiction? And so I have to live in that world, right? Yeah. <laughs> I have to. And so it's, it's a very frustrating thing to be like, well, I don't want to addict my people, right? But at the same time, to create good content and all that. And I, you know, I don't know. I've got another fun idea. I won't share that one, but it's just like, it's, it could be a very gripping series that, that um, I think would just be amazing for even the outside market to, to, to understand and enjoy. And yet, um, you know, again, but at the end of the day, if I, you know, again, it's kind of like the, is it, uh, is the cost outweigh the other? And, and if, and so again, it's like, I just see that so many of society is, is wasting so much time in film and stuff. And so it's like, I have to try to navigate that water a little bit so that I'm not, um, what I'd say, um, chaining down my people rather than breaking them free. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, this is a big reason why we wanted to have you guys on like, um, it's a old business, right. Um, and then, you know, you've gone through harrowing times, your words and, uh, transitions and pivots and this takes business acumen um, some courage to make decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's a lot that uh, folks can, can learn from, you know, your guys' business model and, and yeah. pivoted and adjusted over the years. So um, you guys are obviously excited about the, the future and that'll be fun to watch. But thank you so much for, for taking the time to join the thank podcast today, Matt. Well, thank you it. for having me on. It's been a pleasure, a pleasure to meet you, Garrett. And, um, you know, I appreciate what you guys do here too. Cool. So thank you. Thank you.